Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Aquarium of the Pacific's lecture series. I'm Jerry Schubel, president of the Aquarium, and it's great to have all of you joining us this evening, although we would prefer to have you here in person. We hope that you're all staying home and taking care of yourselves. I want to thank our lecture sponsors, Gazette Newspapers, and also the, the Courtyard Marriott. Tonight, Dr. Lewis M. Duncan will discuss emerging technologies and maritime warfare in the 21st century. Dr. Duncan is the Provost, Dean of Faculty, and Chief Operating Officer of the U.S. Naval War College in Rhode Island. He's a founding member and co-chair of the Board of Directors of the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space. This is the organization that's responsible for managing the International Space Station's National Laboratory. Before joining the, the Naval War College, he was president of Rollins College in Florida. Before that, he was the dean of the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth College. And before that, he was the provost and acting president of the University of Tulsa. Every institution he has led, he has transformed and made it into a far, far better institution. He received all of his degrees, bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Rice University in Houston, Texas. Dr. Duncan is an experimental research scientist in space physics, in radio physics, and quantum engineering. He remains active in national security studies, emphasizing emerging technologies, space-based systems, nuclear deterrence, and nonproliferation cyber conflict, artificial intelligence, and autonomous systems. And he also focuses on the ethics and the societal implications of technology. Tonight, he will compare and contrast the efforts of China and the United States for military preparedness in the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lewis M. Duncan. Lewis? Thank you for that generous introduction. And it's indeed um, my sincere pleasure to be with you this evening uh, to talk about uh, an effort that's near and dear to my heart, that is the role of emerging technology in shaping the future of society. And uh, tonight we'll talk about its uh, cooperation, competition, and conflict on the world's oceans uh, and the possibilities uh, and, and the implications of maritime warfare in the 21st century. First, let me begin, though, with a disclaimer, uh, which is also in the bottom of the first slide, which is that the opinions that I'm expressing are mine alone and not those of the U.S. Naval War College or the Department of Defense or the U.S. government. Uh, I'd love to talk about uh, the revolutions happening in technology right now, uh, and I categorize it into three areas. One of nanotechnology, which are micromaterials, uh, microfabrication, 3D printing, and so forth, a revolution in biotechnology, uh, particularly at the genetic level, and a revolution in information technology involving computing and robotics. Uh, I would uh, also like to put this in a sense of a geopolitical context. So uh, after Thomas Friedman's uh, reference, the world is indeed flat. It's a much smaller place. Uh, we're interconnected and interdependent. Uh, but when we look at this map, we also see something else, and that is that we are still a world of nation states. Uh, we are divided uh, by political boundaries, not, not as often geographic ones these days, uh, and that a lot of faced world's uh, behavior and response to, to stimuli and, and events is... Uh, from the perspective of nation states. And then, uh, in, in somewhat in contrast, the world is also very spiky. If you look at population, uh, we have congregated uh, with more than 80% of the world's population living within uh, 100 kilometers of a coast and, the, and many mega cities, which are coastal cities. Uh, and the scarcity, the competition for resources uh, leads to uh, potential conflict among uh, nation states, uh, and, and particularly 
uh, I believe, uh, as on the global commons that we call the world oceans. So uh, a couple of things that most of the audience, uh, most of your listeners are probably aware of, uh, that, that more than 90% of the world's trade, global, international trade, uh, passes uh, through, through uh, maritime shipping uh, around the world. And, and uh, this map uh, shows uh, the, the frequency of, of those uh, transport routes. Uh, also uh, recognizing that there are uh, less than a, a dozen very key strategic locations for, for that entire international trade. The same is true when it comes to the information network. Uh, more than 99% of all uh, international information exchange passes through undersea cables uh, with a capable nation of, of being disrupted uh, intentionally. Uh, and uh, we've, we've seen examples already of where uh, it's almost crippling when uh, a nation is cut off from, from the internet. Uh, we are in a resource limited world. Uh, it's, it's been noted at the World Economic Forum that 90% uh, of our fishing stocks are, are in the red, that is they're being used up. We continue to, uh, if not exhaust, at least fatigue the resources of the nation, not just in proteins and, and and uh, fisheries, but uh, when it comes to mining materials, uh, the, the materials uh, of our uh, high technologies, uh, we are exhausting the earth of its fossil fuels in, in the name of energy. Uh, and uh, we are also uh, faced with, with now uh, fresh water issues uh, and access to, to resources around the uh, so we have to talk about the world in terms of cooperation and competition uh, in, in this uh, now resource-constrained environment. Uh, it's also been pointed out that uh, in terms of the world's oceans, we are, by some estimates, running at about three times its carrying capacity in terms of world population uh, and what we are withdrawing from it without necessarily replenishing. And so uh, I like to talk with hope about uh, emerging technologies and what they can bring to, to uh, the world in terms of, of healthcare and longevity, in terms of new materials and new ways of doing things, technologies that enhance our lives. Uh, but uh, I, as the military says, hope is not a strategy. Uh, and uh, this is not that hopeful talk. Uh, th this is more of the end of the world type of talk. Because there's, uh, uh, while we have enjoyed 75 years with uh, uh, a relative peace time, at least on a global scale, uh, very few, very few of us, very few are alive who remember the last time that the world was actually at war. Uh, but that is not a natural state historically for uh, for this long of a period, and there's reasons to believe that. Uh, the Third World War may be, may be coming toward us. In fact, uh, if you look in cyberspace uh, and some events in outer space, uh, you might, might say that the first steps in, toward that Third World War have already begun. Uh, and uh, as I'll make the case in this talk, uh, there's reason to believe that uh, this will be a war conducted in cyberspace and outer space, but uh, Mostly, I believe it will be a war uh, above, on, and under the oceans, uh, a maritime war. And uh, just in the last couple of years, our national defense strategy has uh, defined a, a, a clear strategic goal of, of preparing us, uh, wanting to preserve peace through strength, but preparing us for the possibility of what they call near-peer uh, competition, near-peer conflict. Uh, with rivals and in what is now, once again, a multipolar world. So I wanted to briefly talk about Russia, uh, which is a reemergent, uh, and I describe it as an opportunistic power. Uh, it's uh, the, the uh, Crimea Bridge, which is shown here across the Kerch Straits, uh, connects uh, the mainland Russia with the Crimea Peninsula that they uh, uh, reacquired uh, forcefully from Ukraine. Uh, they, are, they have military forces in Syria. Uh, just in the news uh, recently were 
concerns that they are providing warplanes to one of the factions in Libya. Uh, they uh, flourish in, in chaos, uh, and they, they tend to be more aggressive when the world is looking someplace else. Uh, they, they mastered the art of gray forces, the, the, the paramilitary forces in, uh, in Ukraine recently, and, and uh, they are a reemergent power, uh, uh, particularly as a nuclear power that, uh, that we were uh, in a stable uh, nuclear world with for the last uh, 75 years. Uh, and a new interest of Russia is the Arctic. Uh, as as uh, the earth warms, uh, uh, and I don't want to become political, uh, to, to some extent from human activity, but also probably for some extent for the fact that the earth has been warming for the last 13,000 years since the end of the last ice age, uh, the Arctic is melting. Uh, and the Arctic Ocean is becoming accessible. Uh, and uh, there are Russian military bases uh, um, circumscribing much of the, uh, of, of the navigable uh, Arctic Ocean. Uh, and they share, we, we share the Arctic uh, among eight nations, uh, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Iceland, uh, Denmark through Greenland, Canada, the US and Russia. And, and we are just now beginning to negotiate exactly how that becomes a shared resource. Uh, historically, uh, we draw lines, even though lines are not possible to be drawn in water, but we draw boundaries uh, that begin to define regions, spheres of uh, influence and, and uh, na nation state uh, preferred rights. Uh, there are still disputed areas. Uh, Based upon an extended continental shelf, and those are those are being handled mostly uh, peacefully. Uh, the uh, uh, the U.S. is uh, well represented, except in terms of force. We have only a uh, a single icebreaker, one and a half, if you count one that's sometimes operational icebreakers that operate in the Arctic, compared to to many many more uh, from uh, our Russian colleagues. Uh, but uh, th this is another place where Russian opportunism uh, expresses itself as in terms of claims to, to more and more of the Arctic Sea. Uh, but I, as uh, my introduction stated, I wanted to talk more about China, which is an emergent ambitious power. Uh, if, one, if you're willing to go back uh, uh, about 600 years, you could argue that they are a re-emergent power. Uh, because under the Ming Dynasty, uh, they, they had uh, a 3,500 ship Navy and Merchant Marine uh, and renowned treasure fleets that uh, traded throughout the world, uh, the known world at that time. Uh, today, we, uh, we have uh, concerns about uh, uh, future future challenges with uh, an, a rising power like China. And it's often referred to in a historical context of called the Thucydides trap. Uh, Thucydides uh, was a historian uh, in the, the fifth century BC who recorded uh, the, the, a, a rising situation in, in, the, in, on, in the Greek peninsula uh, between the, the established military and, and uh, sole power of Sparta, and then the flourishing uh, educational, commercial, um, philosophical, uh, and, and arts world of Athens as it was rising. And it was the, the fear of a rising Athens that uh, inevitably led to conflict, not directly at first, but through uh, uh, subordinate alliances and, and then alliance countries that came into conflict. But ultimately, Athens and Sparta became, became engaged in a protracted war, which uh, nominally Sparta won, uh, but both states were so weakened that it left the Greek peninsula open to uh, uh, later, later intrusion of Persian forces. Uh, and there has been, uh, from a, a well-regarded analysis by Graham Allison, uh, an article published in Atlantic Magazine talking about the Thucydides trap, uh, that it 
that in nominally something like 16 examples <clears throat> of where a rising power uh, what was uh, beginning to, to Im, uh, impose its uh, interests on an established power, that in roughly three quarters of those, a little more than three quarters of those examples, uh, it ended ultimately in, in war. Uh, and so uh, it was fascinating to see that uh, President Xi Jinping of, of China is well aware of the Thucydides trap and uh, recognizes that we need to be aware of its uh, uh, of its possibilities and work together to try to avoid it. Uh, however, um, I I, uh, I use a quote that he gave, which is uh, uh, what we like to hear. It's true that China is a rising uh, power, but it is a peaceful rise, and it has no interest in. Uh, upsetting the world order or um, having conflict with the United States. Countries, uh, when they are the rising power, do not immediately uh, put themselves into conflict with the established power. But over time, that, that tends to happen sim simply, be simply because there's misunderstandings and uh, misgivings between countries. Uh, and the, the rising power, of course, on uh, quite naturally would like to have greater influence over the areas of uh, uh, of, of its own dominion. Uh, let's look at the South China Sea. Uh, if you can see the, the light blue lines, those are the historical nation state boundaries uh, that belong to uh, not only China, but Vietnam, the Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia. The red dashed line, which is often referred to as the nine dashed line from an old map representation of it, is, is what China now claims as belonging to them. Uh, and uh, you can see why it would cause some anxiety among uh, the, the other nation states that share boundaries on the, on the South China Sea uh, to reinforce their, uh, their claim to, to, to uh, the territorial waters of the South China Sea. China has also taken upon itself to, uh, uh, to expand its land holdings and islands. Up until uh, 1909, uh, the island of Hainan in the, in the upper left uh, was the, the most southern extent of China. Uh, from 1909 to 1935, they uh, settled something called the Parcel Islands, just a little bit off that coast. Uh, but in the last uh, three years now, approaching four years, they've begun to uh, to, to to build on shoals and reefs uh, and, uh, and produce what are referred to as artificial islands. Uh, the, the example I give, the Scarborough Shoal, shoal on the, on the right-hand side, uh, that, uh, the top picture shows what the shoal looked like uh, at, uh, historically. It's an, a satellite image of it. Uh, its highest point above water was 1.8 meters. Uh, and most of it was underwater at high tide. Uh, the lower picture shows uh, the, the, the restored island uh, now claimed by uh, China, uh, also claimed that it has absolutely no military uh, interest in that island, but uh, for, for, for all first impressions, it looks like a military base. Uh, they have uh, had similar uh, use of islands, uh, creation of artificial islands uh, further down in the South China Sea, particularly through the Spratlan Islands that you can see there getting closer to Malaysia. Uh, and, and so they, they have made the territorial claim as the red dash line shows to, to having dominion over the, uh, essentially the entire South China Sea. But it doesn't necessarily end there. They are, as I mentioned, they are a rising power. And so if we look at their, uh, their, their silk and belt road uh, strategy, which they o openly talk about, it's to both uh, restore the, a, a, vari <clears throat> a variation of the original silk road overland path, but also a maritime uh, silk road that uh, what is sometimes referred to as the, a string of pearls with uh, uh, bases and ports uh, extending 
across the Indian Ocean and, and over in through the Mediterranean. Uh, and uh, they, they have used their financial capabilities to become, um, uh, to, to have home ports uh, in, in all of these locations, though, though not military ports. Uh, and they like to make that distinction. But nevertheless, uh, Ch China is demonstrating a more global interest than, uh, uh, than even just its claim to the South China Sea. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about what future conflict might look like. It, it will not look like the past. And um, the American military, the American Navy right now is very keen on uh, exploring a, and applying and, and deploying uh, the, the new technologies of the 21st century because the American Navy today uh, is very capable uh, of uh, assuredly fighting and winning every war of the 20th century. Uh, but the uncertainties, the, the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment of conflict in the 21st century with all of the capabilities of these emerging technologies uh, provides uh, uh, a world that's actually not safe for global war. Uh, we've looked at uh, particularly the nuclear uh, uh, mutually assured destruction, the balance that was struck with the Soviet Union uh, and, uh, and thus far managed to avoid uh, thermonuclear war. Uh, we have uh, treaties against the use of uh, chemical weapons. Uh, we have weapons of mass disruption today, though. Cyber war is perhaps already underway uh, and, as, and as a tool which has been used in, uh, in, in uh, conflicts over the last uh, two decades. Uh, not, not just the direct assaults on military against military, but attacking civilian infrastructures that are key for both civilian and military use. Uh, and uh, we'll talk in a little bit about pandemics, uh, the, the, the role that they can have in terms of disrupting the society as we're experiencing right now. Uh, the kinds of advanced technologies and where new weapon systems are coming from. And these weapon systems may not only be disruptive, but they might be decisive in different, uh, different domains. Uh, the use of uh, robotics and autonomous systems, directed energy weapons, uh, uh, hypersonic missiles that travel at uh, several times or more the, the, the sound speed, uh, the role of artificial intelligence and both big data uh, and then the ability of autonomous systems to, uh, to make decisions for themselves. And then I, uh, again, I'll talk about synthetic biology toward the end of this talk. But uh, the weapon systems that are being developed today are faster, smarter, smaller, cheaper, more or less le lethal depending upon mission. Uh, and uh, again, quoting Thomas Friedman in Lexus and the Olive Tree, he said, we've evolved from a world in which the big eat the small to a world in which the fast eat the slow. Uh, and I would extend that in the 21st century to one in which the smart uh, actually conquer the, the, I don't want to say stupid, but uh, the less smart. Uh, smarter machines, smart, smarter technologies, uh, smarter civilizations will have decisive advantage. And in the history of technology, when two civilizations come into contact in which one has a decided technological advantage, uh, the less technologically developed society is either assimilated or exterminated. Uh, there really has not been historical examples of peaceful coexistence. And so it's important to be on the front edge of, of this technological advance. The kinds of next generation weapons we're likely to see in the maritime environment uh, include hypersonic missiles, uh, those that uh, uh, fly at several times the speed of uh, sound are maneuverable uh, and are designed in particular to overcome uh, what are now our existing kinds of missile defense systems. Uh, directed energy weapons, it was just a, an announcement in the paper uh, 
uh, in the last day or two of a successful laser intercept of, of a missile from a, a Navy ship in the Pacific. Uh, the use of, of drones, the, the, uh, the, the picture in the lower left is uh, a theoretical airplane, but it's made out of a swarm of drones who are acting in a distributed intelligence manner. Uh, and swarms of drones uh, can present uh, almost un unmanageable issues in terms of self-defense uh, against an, an, an offensive set of drones. Smart minds, those that are autonomous and can, be, can lie dormant and even uh, are capable of, of uh, uh, waiting until they hear specific signatures uh, to to uh, attack or to, uh, to pursue their mission. Uh, uh, those kinds of, of uh, smart minds are, are well within reach of, of the military today and in the near future. Uh, autonomous military systems exist uh, today and are rapidly advancing. Uh, from uh, autonomous planes uh, to autonomous ships to autonomous submarines. Uh, and when I talk about rapidly advancing, uh, it, it's important to understand that uh, uh, technology advances exponentially. And we often don't fully appreciate that because we experience the world linearly, uh, that uh, we, we see things within our own perspective and, and tend to draw a straight line uh, and, and don't appreciate the, exponential, the power of an exponential. And I use a, uh, a social party game to try and demonstrate that, that uh, if, if you had a fishbowl that contained a single marble and one minute later it doubled to two marbles and a minute later doubled to four, and in an hour the fishbowl was full, then the, the, the puzzle question is, well, when was the fishbowl half full? And the answer is the 59th minute, and then it doubled one more time. But if you were standing back from the fishbowl, you, you would see it and it would look like nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. And then explosively in the last two or three minutes, you would see that the bowl suddenly fills up with marbles. Well, that's kind of the way technology sneaks up on us, uh, that it is on an exponential growth rate, uh, well understood, uh, but that uh, we don't really see it happening until uh, and, until it occurs before our eyes, and that's what's happening right now in terms of autonomous systems and military systems. And uh, it, it is a race that uh, is, is certainly one that has decisive advantage in lots of spheres. Uh, what, one of the differences, though, uh, today that from uh, historical case studies is that the technological advancements uh, the innovations and the exponential curves are being driven not by the military, but by private industry, by commercial concerns. Industry is actually the, the, the source of a lot of our uh, greatest discoveries. This is the, the port, the, the Maersk Depot uh, port at, in Long Beach. Uh, and as you uh, look at it, there's one thing that's strikingly missing, uh, and that is people. Uh, it is a fully automated port, uh, and uh, with a with a lot of conflict because uh, uh, longshoremen are have lost their jobs to machines. Uh, interestingly, self-driving trucks may may next mean that that not even the truck drivers who who transport the goods over land will be safe from autonomous kinds of uh, technological innovation over the next decade or so. But uh, the message here is that uh, a lot of these advancements are not occurring because they are motivated by military application, but have, uh, but are, are motivated by their commercial uh, advantages. Uh, and then they uh, are applied to, to uh, military interests. So I'm concerned that uh, in this world uh, of future technology competition uh, here in the, here in America, we we may not be well uh, currently well situated in order to to achieve that. That 
uh, uh, as, as an educator for my whole career, I, I have to point out that we, uh, we have fallen behind in terms of our understanding and appreciation of science. It's in the news uh, nightly right at the moment. Uh, some of the conflict between our feelings and scientific facts. Uh, science education has fallen behind and, uh, and is not particularly well regarded in terms of government funding. So I wanted to talk about uh, synthetic biology and, and in the context of the pandemic that we're having. Uh, but uh, again, when I talk about weapons being something that we pursue faster, uh, uh, become more adaptable, uh, the US military and militaries across the world are actually quite sluggish. We, we today have aircraft carriers that uh, are built for 50 year lifetimes. Uh, I'm convinced that uh, because we image the entire earth from space on a daily basis, that the idea that uh, at least surface ships can hide uh, is, uh, is no, no longer viable. Uh, and that the long range hypersonic missiles uh, will place aircraft carriers at great risk uh, uh, in any sort of forward deployment. Uh, but we buy systems, big systems like ships, um, the same way that, that you and I buy our home. Uh, that is that if you buy a new house, you would hope uh, that 50 years from now, it would still basically function as a, as a home. Uh, we need to, we're, we're trying to accelerate so that we buy military systems more like the way that you and I would buy a car, which is that in maybe 10 or 15 years, we would think that it would probably have to be replaced, uh, or at least it would begin to be uh, uh, not competitive with, with the cars that were coming out at the time. But in reality, because of the speed of technology, we need to replace those technologies at a, at a speed of uh, the way that, that we should be replacing our computers. Uh, that, that the faster chips, the new capabilities, the new applications uh, are on almost a, a, a one or two year basis, uh, something that needs to be replaceable. We do have uh, one ship in the Navy right now, the Zumwalt, that's designed to be modular in that sense, that it has a uh, strong power base, electrical power base, uh, but it, it has modules that can be uh, put in and then taken out and replaced with newer modules so that the, the structure of the ship uh, may be good for a much longer period, but, but the actual working parts of the ship in terms of uh, weapon systems and sensors, uh, that, that those can be uh, generally readily replaced. So let me talk about bioweapons. Uh, when uh, I was the Dean of Engineering at Dartmouth, uh, a colleague of, of mine, uh, Professor Joe Rosen, and I uh, hypothesized the possibility that uh, with genetic engineering, uh, biowarfare could be, become possible again. And we looked at, um, we convened a group of geneticists. They, they talked about, um, uh, in, in their case, they proposed genetically modifying a version of smallpox that exists in other primates, but for which there was no human immunity. Uh, and then we ran a tabletop exercise on um, first responders. Uh, local, state, and federal. Uh, and the result from that was catastrophic. Uh, the first to die were the first responders. Uh, and the only real survivors were those who ran away. Uh, what was uh, concerning was that uh, that, that would, in, in principle, have, have the possibility of killing everyone. Uh, but the geneticist said it doesn't have to. You can begin to, to tailor, uh, using genetic identities, begin to tailor uh, bioweapons against certain categories of people. Well, we, we, uh, 
we reconvened a group of, of uh, geneticists, biologists, microbiologists, and uh, more importantly, graduate students and postdocs from some of the top schools a, a couple of years ago in a reprisal of that tabletop. Uh, over the last 30 years or so, we've learned how to read the genetic code. It's uh, a computer uh, they combine together to form a family of a couple dozen uh, amino acids and, and that form enzymes and that collectively they, they form the, the, an inventory of proteins of which we're all made. Uh, but, but basically the common stuff and, and a four billion line code is a big computer code, but it's not, a, it's not a, an infinite one and we can read it. Uh, and we are even now beginning uh, to understand how to modify it. Because the first thing a computer programmer does when they write a code, unless they're far better than anyone I know, is they have to debug it. And so geneticists, uh, young geneticists, are looking at ways of debugging the genetic code. Uh, one of the real ethical questions, and, and in the introduction as pointed out, I love teaching the ethics of emerging technology, uh, one of the real questions is who gets to decide what is a bug? Uh, what, is, what is something that needs to be corrected? Uh, but the young geneticists at our, uh, at, at our uh, workshop two years ago now uh, stole the show because these are not young people who, who only read genetic code. They are fluent at writing genetic code. Uh, and not only can they write in the four letters that nature gave us, but they, um, they have designed new letters uh, that, that don't exist in nature. And the, the tools for manipulating at its genetic level uh, are, are available, are widely available, CRISPR kits that allow you to, to snip and tuck and cut and add to the genetic code. Uh, and uh, while we, look at ways of, of debugging the code and, and fixing it, uh, it's now possible to actually start improving upon ourselves and all of the ethics that comes with, with that kind of concern. And also to develop synthetic biological weapons. Um, one of the young uh, postdocs at, at the conference, at the workshop we held, uh, talked about how uh, a synthetic biological weapon for which there was no human immunity uh, could, uh, could incapacitate uh, uh, whole armies or whole navies. Uh, and we've seen with the COVID-19 uh, virus, the, the challenges that happen when it gets on a ship, uh, whether it be a cruise ship or an aircraft carrier. Uh, that uh, and, and there's many many characteristics of the COVID-19 that uh, uh, look like a, a bioweapon. I'm not at all saying that it was manufactured for that purpose. Uh, there's no evidence uh, that I'm aware of that uh, this was created uh, as a bioweapon, but it has a number of the characteristics that one would ascribe to, to a, an effective weapon. It is highly infectious and it has, uh, a significant period of latency. That is the period between when you're infected and are infectious uh, and when you first start showing symptoms. Indeed, for the coronavirus, uh, I think the current estimates are that roughly half of those infected don't, don't actually show symptoms, even though they may be infecting others uh, unknowingly. Uh, so um, we, are, we are facing a nuclear arms control type of environment that needs to be applied to bioweapons and particularly to the synthetic biology, the, the ones which don't exist in nature. Uh, and uh, if, if I were to uh, talk about the end of the world in terms of warfare, I think it may be uh, that, that uh, we're getting a, a mild lesson in, in uh, what a, pan, a real pandemic can do, but not just to the economy, but in terms of loss of life. And, uh, and this is for a, uh, the coronavirus for which 
there seems to be an, a very high survival rate uh, and, and even a high asymptomatic rate. So I, I am concerned that uh, bioweapons that are far more difficult to control, that can, they, that can be manufactured in small laboratories, uh, it doesn't take a gaseous diffusion enrichment plant or uh, large facilities, that, that these may be the weapons of the Third World War and, uh, and consequences come from that. So uh, although Einstein was talking about nuclear weapons, uh, I think that the, uh, the concern we have is that uh, the world is no longer safe for a world war. And yet the same historical forces that often drive us into that type of conflict are at work. Uh, and it's up to all of us to find ways to, to, to prevent uh, misunderstandings uh, and uh, conflicting competition for finite resources uh, and alliances that uh, are uh, in, entangling and endangering uh, can lead us into, into situations that um, for, for which human, all of humanity is even at risk. So I'd like to end on a hopeful note, uh, and that is that uh, uh, because this is a fairly dis distressing type of talk, uh, that, that the techn technological tools that could actually allow us to destroy humanity allow us to save it as well. Uh, and understanding that uh, a lot of the, the separations that we have, the, the nation state boundaries, the, uh, the, the competition on what is the global commons of the oceans, uh, that, that we are actually all the same. We are one human race and we share uh, one precious earth. And, and I, while my generation was able to navigate the, the relatively simplistic uh, but dangerous nuclear arms race, uh, I think this technological arms race that we're in right now presents even greater dangers and even greater opportunities. Uh, and we call upon the rising generations uh, to, to embrace the challenges that come with that. Uh, to both preserve the earth for future generations and to recognize uh, that we are all global citizens, uh, one earth and one human race. I wanna thank you for, uh, for listening to this uh, and uh, I'm, I'm available. I believe uh, I'll be taking some questions uh, or at least as part of, part of a discussion that follows. So thank you very much. Lewis, thank you. That was a, a very informative, Troubling talk. Um, there's a wonderful book called Experiments in Ethics by Kwame Apaya. And he says in that book, the challenge is less about figuring out how to play the game than it is figuring out what game we're playing. It seems to me that the US, in many areas, we're playing the game of the last century. And somehow we need to play a new game. Comment on that, please. Even to the extent that uh, we sometimes conflate uh, short-term game and, and long-term best interests uh, for humanity, not just ourselves. If you were to ask about your identity, uh, we would say, I'm an American, or whatever nationality one might have. Um, very few of us would would look at this beautiful picture of the earth and say, no, I am a, a citizen of the earth. Uh, and, and that's striking because when you talk about the games that we're playing, uh, you can get very different answers to the question of uh, many of the greatest challenges to society today are global challenges, whether it's caring for the oceans uh, and their limited resources or the distribution of wealth or healthcare uh, or, or climate change, uh, you can get a very different answer if you ask what's best for the world 
as compared to saying, what's best for the US? What's best for me? Uh, and, and I think the, the game that we're playing, the, the questions that we're being asked, uh, em, empowered by technology, uh, but we're being asked questions now where it's imperative that we begin to, to find answers that, that say what's best for all of us, uh, because it is a shared world. And, and we're not in a place, if it comes to World War III, no one wins. No one wins the next world war. We all lose. Uh, and all of these, and, and these so, problems that we, we face, the issues we face, fall into the category of what often are called now wicked problems, problems that cross yes. disciplinary <laughs> yes. boundaries, problems that can't be solved. There's no silver bullet. If you frame them properly and you get the right kind of cooperation across disciplines, you can manage them to keep them in within bounds. But I think most of us were never trained to deal with wicked problems. Do, do you see in our colleges and universities now, is there more emphasis on how to deal with this new category of problems, or are we still training what have been referred to as brick makers? Because you get promoted and tenured by the individual contributions, packets of information, knowledge you produce. Well, I am, I am encouraged. I, I, it's, you could not tell from this talk, but I have been accused of being a pathological optimist. Uh, and and uh, having worked with young people as an educator for uh, most of my professional life, uh, I do see that among the rising generation of young people, there is a sense of responsibility for the environment, for humanity, for the world. Uh, and that uh, the first global citizens are out there. Uh, I, I think when one talks about the world's oceans, there's no way that you can talk about the oceans in terms of, of specific nation state rights or, or desires. Uh, it is a global commons, it's a shared resource. So I am very hopeful that the rising generation will be able to address those. The place where I'm less optimistic uh, is that at the very time that uh, many of these problems need to be addressed uh, scientifically, technologically, uh, we're falling behind, at least in this country, in, in understanding how things work and understanding how to come up with solutions, uh, not just uh, not, not just speeches, not just talking about it, uh, but being good engineers, which is to go and find solutions and implement them. And I, I would agree with you. I, 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 I was attracted to Dartmouth's engineering school. And by the way, I mean, I have to, in full disclosure, I was dean of the oldest professional engineering school in the country, and yet I have no engineering degrees. <laughs> My and, degrees are in, in physics and mathematics and space physics. Uh, and but I was attracted. Uh, Sylvanus Thayer is also the father of West Point, so the Thayer School at Dartmouth uh, had a mission statement of to prepare the most capable and faithful for the most responsible positions and the most difficult service. And I think young people today are stepping up to that kind of leadership of recognizing uh, what is responsible and what is difficult uh, and, and those leaders are out there. They are coming. And, uh, and uh, I wish that we could have solved all of the world's problems before they inherited it from us, just as we promised them we would do. Uh, but we left a few still to be tackled. I think one of the remar remarkable things about the uh, School of Engineering at Dartmouth is that it's embedded in arts and sciences so that the, the training is broad. It goes beyond engineering and math. It includes the arts and the humanities. Do you think that's important? I, I think it's very important. It's, uh, uh, this is not a promotional film for the Dartmouth Engineering School, but uh, it, uh, you cannot go there and major in electrical engineering or mechanical engineering or chemical engineering. Uh, they have but a single degree called engineering sciences, and it is uh, engineering writ large, which is finding problems in the world, coming up with solutions and implementing them. Uh, and in that sense, we are all engineers. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and, and I think that it's embedded as part of a uh, sound liberal education. As, as uh, Jefferson said, uh, 
A strong democracy requires an informed and an engaged citizenry. And it takes both the information and the ability to become engaged. And uh, the problems in the world will not be solved without that going forward. And in many ways, I think we're failing to give them, the young people who have the desire to, to deal with these issues, we're failing to give them the tools that they need. Now, you mentioned the, the amount that we spend on healthcare versus the amount we spend on physical sciences. If you look at the federal investment in research, in research, more than half of it goes to the medical sciences, leaving less than half to be split among math, physics, chemistry, engineering. That's not how you build a nation that uh, is ready to play the game of the 21st century. Well, and, and uh, I agree with you, although I'm not looking to reduce the amount of funding that goes to healthcare, just no. recognize that there's a need uh, for investment in other areas of science and technology. Although the, uh, the, one of the points I made toward the end of my talk, uh, we are seeing that uh, the engines for, for discovery and innovation are actually shifting away from federal funding uh, to, to private industry. Uh, just, uh, I haven't turned on my radio to look, but as uh, I'm, I'm keenly interested in uh, the, the SpaceX launch to the International Space Station, which uh, was scheduled to have taken place just a few minutes ago. Uh, and... Uh, and over time, I'm sure that uh, we will be successful. Uh, but it's coming out of the creative minds of industry, uh, not, not relying always on the federal taxpayer to be the source of the, the fundamental research and the discovery, and then the, the applications and innovations that come from that. Uh, I, I think that's a positive move. Uh, and and uh, as, as long as we have um, you know, bright young minds that uh, are willing to invest the, the hard work it takes to, to work at the frontiers of knowledge, I, th I think humanity will be fine. I want you to say just a word about uh, the U.S. as a maritime nation. We were founded as a leading maritime nation. We were a shipbuilder, a, ma a major shipper, um, a ma major marine power. Uh, and we no longer can build the largest ships in the world. Those come out of Korea or Japan. Uh, we no longer, if you go to the port of Long Beach or Los Angeles, it's unlikely you'll ever see a ship flying a U.S. flag. Um, we've, so we've lost much of this, this leadership, or have we? Are we still the leader in, in research and technology in the world ocean? Um. Well, that's a broad question because there are so many dimensions to, to science and technology and, and, uh, and its applications. I, I think we still lead the world right now in terms of uh, the creative energy that turns ideas into invoices, uh, that, um, that, that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, but... Other parts of the world are trying to copy that. Uh, China is conducting a fascinating experiment. Uh, they are encouraging creativity in terms of science and engineering and applications and, and business entrepreneurship. Uh, the experiment they're conducting, though, is can you do that without also stimulating creative thought and, and bold ideas in social and political environments as well. Uh, and so can you have that kind of creativity come out of such a structured uh, system? I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think America's societal liberties and freedoms uh, are, are at least part of the secret sauce that has caused America to, to lead the world in innovation. Uh, but but we have turned inward, and uh, as you point out, we, we have uh, bequeathed to others the, the leadership in a number of fields. I don't think that any country, I don't think that any country can aspire to have dominion over all areas of science and technology. That, that's why partnerships and coalitions 
are important and ultimately why we need to think of this as, as one earth and, and one human race, not nation states competing against other nation states. Yeah, the, I, the challenge though, sir, is that um, that's, been the, that's been the arc of human history that we have amalgamated from, from individuals and families to clans, to villages, to, to, to cities, to city states, to nation states, to now unions of, of nations. Uh, and, and in almost every case, like the Thucydides trap, if you look historically, in almost every case, that historical aggregation of society has occurred more often by violence and conquest than it has by cooperation and, and uh, collaboration. Uh, and we are now on the threshold of what needs to be this last amalgamation, the, the, the aggregation of humanity into to a global citizenship. Uh, and yet it's no longer safe for that to happen by violence or by force. Uh, it's important that we find a pathway to do that peacefully. I think that's a good note to end on. And, and Lewis, thank you very much for a very stimulating, thought-provoking talk. And when, when all this is over, we'll get you back out here in person. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, very best to you and your, your aquarium and, the, uh, and, and your audience of listeners. Thank you, Lewis.